Okay, now you all know me. We've been doing this for three weeks now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much. It is my honor to be here with you today. Uh, unfortunately, Pre uh, Senator Peralta is running a bit late. I don't know if you know, but he's a pretty busy man. Uh, and he's out there doing lots of wonderful things for the people in Queens and the people of New York. Uh, right now, I would, however, like to introduce to you the president of Queensborough Community College, Dr. Diane Call. Thanks so much for being with us, Dr. Call. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for bringing sunshine, those of you responsible. We deserve it, right? The Common Read is, is quite an important experience at Queensboro, and it's made so because of the incredible engagement of our faculty and support, their support, and most of all, your participation as students. Last year, for those of you who participated, it was a fascinating book and uh, filled with lessons, and this year, certainly, the road of lost innocence is very moving, very difficult, and very important. The common read, as you know, is, is a shared intellectual experience, and that's what you've been having through your discussions and your activities over the last number of weeks. The theme is human trafficking, but it cuts across so many, so many disciplines, and it's not just trafficking, it's, it's broader, it's human rights, it's women's rights, it's social justice. And I really have to again thank the faculty from so many departments who have supported it and incorporated the, the common read, in this case, this amazing, amazing narrative into their classwork, your classwork. There are themes of literature and history, ethics, psychology, health, nursing, sociology, criminal justice. And so no matter what you study at Queensborough, there were things you could relate to this extraordinary story. Unfortunately, human trafficking, as portrayed in this book, is not half a world away and 30 years ago. It's here, and it's now, and it's in our communities. And one of the reasons why it was important for us to have one of our leaders here, Senator Jose Peralta, was because many people are trying to bring greater awareness, and now you're going to bring greater awareness as individual members of our community at large. But Senator Peralta has been a major leader in stimulating an awareness and education and in really calling for accountability through our legal system and services for the, the people who are victimized so terribly. So I, I'm hoping that we cross, because I'm running to another meeting, unfortunately, because he has been a very important person in this effort. He's a New York State Senator. He represents a district that holds almost 10,000 CUNY students, including 1,400 Queensboro students are in his district, and plus our faculty, our staff, and our alums who live in this part of Queens. He really uh, has done a great deal for this effort. We're very proud also that Senator Peralta is a, a CUNY graduate. He graduated from Queens College. So you have much in common. And I hope you share aspirations to really take the lessons, take them to heart, and share the lessons you've experienced and learned, and educate other people about this terrible, terrible, situation of human trafficking and all the things that it has destroyed, lives of people involved, the loved ones of people involved, et cetera. So I congratulate you on work. This was a very difficult book to read. And I know that Senator Peralta will bring you more information about the work that's being done to really try to, to put an end to this so that we don't have to worry about our citizens, our fellow community members who could be snatched off a street or seduced into some false kind of opportunity. It occurs all around us in a very frightening way. And I think when I looked into this more, I was really frightened for, for all of us, especially for the vulnerable. So I thank you, Susan Badira. She's been an amazing person to coordinate this. Thank you, Susan. 
And I, again, thank all of you for your participation and support of the Common Read. Thank you. Thank you. It is my distinct honor to introduce you to Senator Peralta. But before I turn the microphone over to him, I have just a couple things that I want to say to you about this gentleman. First of all, I want you to know that Senator Peralta has spent the last several months fighting for all of you up in Albany to keep tuition affordable within CUNY. And we were very successful with our budget. And with people like Senator Peralta on our side, who also is a CUNY graduate and has thousands and thousands of CUNY alums and current students in his district, we are absolutely delighted that he has carved out some time from his very hectic schedule to be with us today. The topic on human trafficking is nothing new to Senator Peralta. He is a leader. He has been on top of this issue for, for a, a long time. He's been a leader in promoting so that people understand better the issues involved with human trafficking, what their rights are, and how all of you and all of us can help people get through situations. With that note, I'd like to turn it over to Senator Peralta. And again, thank you. Thank you for being a wonderful CUNY graduate, and thank you for being a terrific senator for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Good. Good afternoon. First and foremost, I, I must apologize. Coming from the city uh, takes a while at around this time. And that's why I'm, I was running a bit late. But I wanted to thank you for sticking around. And I want to thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as you know, I, as it was mentioned, I'm State Senator Jose Peralta. And I am a CUNY graduate myself. I attended Queens College just down the road from here. How many of you know Queens College? Good. Yeah. Um, so as a CUNY alumnus, I've always enjoyed these opportunities to come back and talk to young people and hopefully give something useful back. So every time that I get an opportunity to, to talk and speak at, uh, at CUNY, uh, it's a pleasure to come back and, and, and talk to the, to the students. And for this opportunity to talk to you today, I want to thank Academ uh, Academic Program Manager Susan Madera and Queensborough Community College President Dr. Diane Call. How about a big round of applause for both of them? <laughs> and of course, I want to thank all of you. Maybe I just have too much mic on. Hello? Yeah, OK. And of course, I want to thank all of you for your interest uh, in this important issue. Um, when most people hear the term sex trafficking, uh, what they picture in their minds is the horror taking place somewhere halfway across the world in a country where the rule of law and human rights are not nearly as firmly established as they are right here in the United States. The reality, however, is very, very different. A few years ago, I introduced a bill in the state senate to require taxi and livery cab drivers to be made aware of human trafficking. Now, some may wonder well, why cab drivers. You know, New York City cab drivers already undergo a training program for initial licensure and subsequent renewal. Human trafficking awareness would be made part of the initial training and required for license renewals. An idea sort of sparked because if, for those of you who are aware, the aim of the bill was to go after the sex tra uh, trade flourishing on Roosevelt Avenue in Corona and Jackson Heights by curbing the quote unquote free delivery advertised by local pimps and a shuttling of John from Midtown Manhattan into my district. So for those of you who are aware, on Roosevelt Avenue, there's small little cars. Now, if you were in Vegas, it would be completely legal. But here in New York State, it's not. And those small cars, what we call Chica cards. Now, these Chica cards are small little business cars that have very uh, degrading pictures of women on, on them. 
Uh, most of them, most of the pictures are nude. And what ended up happening was that these cards would fall, these distributors would give these cards out uh, to individuals as they were passing by Roosevelt Avenue, and then the men most likely would look at them, throw them on the floor, and they would be laying on the floor. Uh, and on these cards, they would say, they would have a picture of a woman, a naked woman on them, and they would say, free delivery. So what did that mean, free delivery? We realized that the cab industry was involved in moving these women along. And the aim of the bill, like I said, was to curb the sex trade flourishing. Um, whether the Johns were shuttled in by taxi, livery, or private drivers who recruited them in Midtown, or they drive themselves or arrive via one of the various means of public transportation, they descend on the stretch of Roosevelt Avenue from 69th Street to 112th Street, ready for sex and willing to pay for it. Some of these uh, patrons, they've patronized restaurants because there were packages being offered that include dinner, drinks, and of course, a woman. Others hop into mobile brothels parked in the vicinity of Roosevelt Avenue. For those of you who don't know, there were and still are these mobile brothels. And what they look like are trucks that on the outside say that they're movers, and on the inside, they're brothels. So they would get the, the John to come inside the back of this moving truck. Uh, on parked, and then they drive around. They'll drive around for certain areas, and uh, they would do what they have to do, and then they would drop the John off. And that way, there wasn't one specified brothel. There wasn't one um, fixed brothel. There wasn't one fixed location um, because it would move around. The truck would move around. So. Previously, I had introduced a bill with Governor Cuomo signed into law, which Governor Cuomo signed into law, prohibiting the distribution of obscene business card size ads, which is called the Chica cards. Now, those Chica cards were, as I mentioned earlier, legal in Las Vegas, illegal in New York. And they were bombarded on the streets of Roosevelt Avenue. And every time a child would pick these cards up, they began to trade them like baseball cards. Uh, and when we noticed parents coming into my office saying, well, what are we going to do about these cards? Not only are they degrading, but my child is picking them up and they are trading them like baseball cards with other kids. So we realized that we had to do something about this. We realized that we had to introduce a piece of legislation and hopefully turn it into law. So what we did was just that. We introduced the legislation with Assembly Memorial in the Assembly. Uh, the governor signed it into law, and now it is illegal to hand out and distribute these cards on Roosevelt Avenue. But here's the twist. Every time you think you're one step ahead of these individuals, they're two steps ahead of you. And although it is illegal now to have naked women uh, distribute cards of naked women distributed on Roosevelt Avenue, what they've done is now they have women in bikinis. They have women in bikinis, and originally, right after the ban started, and there were, there were some raids, right after the ban started and there were raids, they changed the cards to have pictures of fruits. So, fruits and flowers. So they would say, for the best fruits, contact this number, free delivery. If you want the best apples, if you want the best oranges, if you want the best plums, call this number. And by the way, we're open until 4 o'clock in the morning. And then they realized that if they can promote, they, that, that, that wasn't working as much. So they went to flowers. If you want the best flowers, the best floral arrangements, call this number, free delivery. Now, who orders flowers at 3 o'clock in the morning? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. No one orders flowers at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so they realized that that wasn't really working for them. So then what they did was they went to the woman in a bathing suit. 
And now what they have is women in bathing suits, women in lingerie, um, which is worked much better for them than the fruits and the flowers. But now we're trying to curb that as well. Uh, because we know what they're about. We know what the, what's the reasoning behind these Chica cards, these so-called Chica cards. So we're working with the district attorney's office. We're working with the governor's office. We're working with the assembly to try to curb the distribution of these cards. The harsh reality is that there's absolutely nothing funny about prostitution. You know, when we held press conferences trying to curb these press con these uh, Chica cards, little did we know that the card that we blew up for press purposes was a picture of an international model. We picked one, we blew it up, we held a press conference, and then people started have, having jokes or, or saying some jokes about, well, this is not a Chica card, this is so-and-so. Uh, she's internationally well-known. We didn't know that. Uh, but they took the face and the body of this international model, they put it on a Chica card, and they distributed it. But it's no funny matter. In fact, many women from around the world and across the country are brought here to Queens and are enslaved, forced to have sex with strangers for the profit of human trafficking and pimps. We have to dispel the dangerous notions that prostitution is a victimless crime. And we do that with information and by raising awareness. Someone aware, someone aware of the brutal truth is less likely to participate in the continued exploitation of these women. Someone who understands the flight of these women, who recognize that prostitution is often not a consensual business transaction, is also more likely to say something if they see something. And that was the point of the taxi livery bill, and that was the point of the Chica cards, to raise awareness. Now, several years ago, I did an interview with Channel 47, and it was about human trafficking. Now, they asked me to do something that I couldn't do. They said, we want you to find us one of the victims. Now, we went to organizations, and none of the organizations um, had a victim that was willing to speak. Why? Well, because here's what happens, ladies and gentlemen. A pimp will lure a woman, a young woman, and nowadays they're getting younger and younger, will lure a young woman into the States with all these false promises. Come here. We will not only get you a job, we will maintain your family. We will protect, we'll give you anything that you need to come to this country. And then when they land here or they drive here or they get bused here or trained here, as soon as they land, they take away their passport, they take away their information, and they tell them, OK, I know where your family lives. I know where your relatives live. I know where your friends live. Now you are here. And by the way, you happen to be undocumented. And if you tell anyone, we will run and we'll tell the, IRS, uh, the INS, ICE, and we will inform them that you're here illegally. So now, if you want to make it back, you have to work for us. You have to work for me. And unfortunately, that's why victims do not want to come forward, because they are afraid. They're very, very afraid of what can happen to them, what can happen to their family back home, what can happen to their relatives. They're very afraid. So they asked me to bring a victim. I couldn't find a victim. Uh, fortunately for us, a few days later, a victim actually walked into our office, and she was willing to give her story. Now, she talked about how many children uh, she had based on her lifestyle. She talked about how many times she was raped. She talked about how many years she suffered when all she wanted to do was get out. It was a very, very sad story. She stayed in the business for over 20 years. Mentally abused, physically abused. She finally decided after 20 years to get out. 
she couldn't take it anymore. So she went to various um, organizations to help her out. But at the time, the district attorney and others weren't really looking at the victims or the prostitutes as someone who can be protected. They were also seen as someone who was committing the crime. And that's something that has changed, and that's something that we're trying to change more and more in the minds of the district attorneys. So that the victim, which are the women, can participate and help catch these individuals that are pimping out the women. Now, I just want to stress again that someone who understands what these women are really going through is less likely to participate in the exploitation of these women and is more likely to say something when they see something. The vast majority of livery tax drivers that I mentioned earlier are hardworking individuals and they help sustain their families and do so with great dignity and honesty. But like in everything else, there is those bad apples that really are perpetuating this crime. Now my bill was taken up by the New York City Council. It was a different version of it. Uh, it seeked to condemn an industry so vital to the city's life and economy. Now the point was that justice for trafficked women was important. What we want is to force the traffickers and pimps out of business by making it unprofitable to brutality, to brutally exploit women. Now we can begin this by raising awareness, as I've mentioned. Now that's the objective of my bills which reclassify sex trafficking as a violent felony and increase the minimum jail sentence to five years. Now the minimum sentence currently is one to three years. So I have another bill that I've introduced to reclassify the uh, sentencing time because currently it's not enough to sentence what these individuals are getting sentenced. Now the point of the bill is quite simply, it's to make the punishment fit the crime. Sex trafficking is one of the most violent humanitarian issues of our day. To call it anything it less is to the great dis disregard the trauma, the rape, and the abuse experienced on the part of the victims. We must reclassify sex trafficking as a violent felony and increase the minimum jail sentence for traffickers. Classifying sex trafficking as a violent felony not only raises the minimum sentence for a first offense, it can put someone who commits multiple violent offenses away for life under the persistent violent offender law. The goal is to force the traffickers and pimps out of business, to put them in jail where they belong, and to make it unprofitable to brutally exploit women, which is what currently happens today. Now, I want to leave you with certain statistics that you should contemplate. One of many that I'm sure you've heard throughout this lecture. But if you haven't, I want you to think about this. There are some 27 million slaves in the world today. 27 million. That is more than any other time in human history. More, most of them are trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation and 80% of them are women. And make no mistake, many of them are being abused and exploited in public and private locations in our very own communities, right in our backyard on Roosevelt Avenue. And that's why we're looking to clean up Roosevelt Avenue so that we can send a loud message. If you cleaned up Times Square, we can clean up Roosevelt Avenue. And the bottom line here is human trafficking is a travesty that needs to end because it is not a victimless crime as some people will point to. Now, I know that there's some shows uh, that probably you've seen where they take Johns in um, and they bring, up, bring Johns in and they charge them with crimes. They take their cars, they take their vehicles. Now, these are the type of programs that need to be implemented. And the women who are trafficked need to be protected. We, on a state level, are trying to find funding to protect these women. Because, as I said, they are lured here with the expectations of living the American dream. And then they live that American nightmare once they, they land in this country. And it's something that needs to stop. But the only way it can stop is by toughening the laws it's by enforcing the laws, and it's by ensuring that there's an increase of awareness. 
Because if you understand what human trafficking is all about, you're less likely to participate in it. Now, some of the cab drivers may say, I'm not participating in human trafficking. All I'm doing is driving someone from point A to point B. That's all I'm doing. Well, you're participating in human trafficking if you're receiving 10 to 15, 20% of what they're going to be making. So you know that you are doing something that you shouldn't be doing. And if you know the stories of these victims, if you understand their, their issues, what they've gone through, the sacrifices that, they're going, that they've gone through, you will be less likely as a cab driver to participate in it. Because we're all human. We wouldn't want anyone to suffer in the way that many of these women suffer. And we can talk here and, and, and I can tell stories upon stories upon stories of these victims and nothing will compare to what these women can tell you. But they need assistance, they need help. And as legislators, the way that we can help is by passing legislation, by funding programs that can help these victims really get out of the system. Because there is nothing that helps them. There are, there are no safety nets when it comes to uh, victims of human trafficking. So with that, I wanted to say thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, I wanted to ask, are there different ways that you've gone about to spread awareness of this current issue? Because a lot of people, like, like you've spoken about and the rest of everyone else has spoken about as well, do not know of this current issue going on. I'm actually just recently learning about this in college and, and I'm about to be 20 and that's bad. So I feel bad myself, I'm not going to lie. But I just want to know if there's other ways to spread awareness um, to people, to younger people, as opposed to just people of our age group and older. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the victims are getting younger and younger. And unfortunately, it's not just international. A lot of people talk about international women being brought um, to the United States of America. But there's also a lot of domestic women, local women, that are being um, bussed and trained over from various other states. And education is going to be key. And the idea is to promote these services um, through public uh, service announcements, uh, through the elected officials, through town hall meetings. That's the most that we can do uh, in terms of promoting uh, this issue and learning about this issue. We have pamphlets in my office. We have uh, background information. But in terms of a widespread, I wish that there could be a celebrity that can stand up and say, I'm going to take up this cause. And I'm going to fight for this cause, kind of like uh, Angelina Jolie does for, for something else. Um, or Matt Damon does for something else. So I wish there could be some sort of celebrity that can stand up and say, these are the facts of human trafficking. I was going to say that too, because I'm also in theater. I just finished doing a play not too long ago, and I feel as if um, performances, they are entertaining, but they're also educational. Yeah. So to see something like that could really change a lot of people's perspectives on this current issue that we do have. Well, one of the things that uh, I know that we can do, and I'm glad that you brought this up, is that I'm going to reach out to, um, and I've, I've been in talks with some of the celebrities' agents um, on various other issues, but I'm going to bring that up, that topic up to, um, I happen to know Matt Damon's uh, agent and some of the others. I'm going to bring that up to their agents and see if they're willing to participate in something like this. I mean, I know that what we've done locally is we've created posters, we've, we've put them up on businesses, we've tried to advertise as much as possible with the Mets. Uh, the Mets have been involved uh, it, with this, uh, so we can have their baseball players get involved. But to really reach the masses, you really need someone who's so popular uh, that can just send that message in right after a performance. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Mr. Senator, for your presence today and all the other staff. Um, it's not really a question. I think I just want to bring my idea as, young, as a young 
generation, I mean, representing the, gen the young generation. I think we could speak up by signing petitions to other schools because it will be like um, a voluntary act. Because if we have, we can't go to the uh, administrations and do all those things, but we can sign petitions saying that we are against what is happening to those women and all the other people affected about that. So that's just what I wanted to say, just an idea. Well, petitions are good. I mean, if you can focus your petitions towards the state legislature um, or the city council, whenever you hear of upcoming pieces of legislation that's going to affect human trafficking, you can harness those petitions towards the city council or the state legislature or even on a federal level. Okay. Just make sure that if you do a, a petition drive, you can send it over to certain elected officials that are pushing uh, certain legislation so that they can then take it either to the governor, they can take it to the president, they can take it to the speaker or to the mayor of, of the city. That way it's focused as opposed to you're just collecting a petition saying, well, we're against this, um, but it's not going anywhere. It's just saying that we're against this. Let, focus it towards the elected officials so that they are aware. And believe me, when, as an elected official, if you get 2,000 signatures from people that live in, within your district, you're going to pay attention. Okay. You're, you're, you're not going to dismiss it. You're going to say, okay, there's 2,000 individuals who, are, who all believe in one thing. I need to pay attention to this. And they will sit down with their staff and see what their position is on the matter. But I think that it's important to focus it towards, um, towards elected officials. You know, the problem that we have also is enforcement. The district attorney's hands are sometimes tied because of the rules and regulations and also because of the funding that they have. But enforcement is key. When you have gangs now that are running this operation, it becomes a problem. For example, on Roosevelt Avenue, you have two gangs that are leading the charge on human trafficking. Now, they're moral enemies, but they're friendly because they understand that the most important thing for them is money. So they can deal with each other because they're all making money off of each other. So there's two gangs that control Roosevelt Avenue from one street to another, and then they take on from the other half to the, to the end of Roosevelt Avenue. So these two gangs control um, human trafficking on Roosevelt Avenue. And what we're trying to do is empower and give the district attorney tools that are necessary to go after these gangs. Not only because the leader would be surprisingly if you saw the leader probably walking down the street on Roosevelt Avenue, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think that that's the leader of a gang. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, um, they, they're not flashy. They're not, they're, they're not, they're, they don't fit a certain prototype or profile. It, it could be a woman that's leading the, the gang. It could be an elderly woman, uh, an elderly man. It, you would not think to imagine who is leading the pack on some, of these, on some of these gangs that are dealing with human trafficking. Because if you were to see a woman that, uh, that was, uh, an elderly woman that was sitting in a house or an apartment, you would not think for a minute that she would be the leader of a ring. But that's sometimes the face, and that's sometimes the leader of a ring. And you have to be very careful, and the police um, has to enforce some of these rules and regulations, and sometimes they get, they get thrown off because they get misinformed of where these rings are. Um, but they move from place to place, and I have regular meetings with the 115 and the 110 precinct, which cover the Roosevelt Avenue um, uh, area, and even they sometimes are stumped on who's leading the charge, because if one goes down, another one comes up, and, and that's how it is. It's like a snowball effect. Okay, thank you. Senator Peralta, would you be willing to reach out to us in some way to let us know when these issues are pending? Because sometimes it's hard to keep, keep up to date with everything. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we do is, uh, Deanne is here with me. We will give you a business card, and then we can put you on our email list. Uh, on a weekly basis, we send out an email blast on all the issues that are kind of hot uh, for, that, for that week. And 
from time to time throughout the year, we talk about issues like human trafficking and others that are, that are on the verge of, of either being discussed with the governor or are, are hot issues that we should pay attention to because they will be discussed with the governor down the road, or even on the city level, on the federal level. Um, but if you can give us the information, we'll put you on our email blast list so that you can receive that, that info. And also, Senator, I would like to know, do you also go to the high schools? Because that, that's, uh, that's really a basis. Because young women, they are so vulnerable. Yes, I, I, I go to high schools as well. I go at, as, as low as elementary schools uh, because I talk to the, to the kids and the children at the elementary school level, at the high school level, and at the college level uh, because, as I said, they're getting younger and younger. And for people to be misled, um, you have the problem, not only human trafficking, but also kids are joining gangs at a much younger age because the gang leaders know that the 10-year-old is not going to go to jail if they're moving something, if they're moving a product, or they're moving uh, something that they want to move. So we go, we go to PTA meetings, and we talk to the parents so that the parents can be aware of if their kids are involved in something that they don't feel is that they should be involved in. If, for example, the kid comes home with a very expensive iPad and their kid says, oh, no, my friend lent it to me. Well, no, no friend lends, lends an iPad uh, for a whole month. Uh, or if they have gang signs inside their books. And parents have to actually play a role and get involved um, as well. Because sometimes I know as parents, we get busy. And unfortunately, we're, we don't pay as much attention as we should uh, to our kids and what they're doing. But they should. And so we go, we talk not only to the kids, but we also talk to the parents. Yes. Could you please give me more information about this law? The law is pursuing not only the person that gives away the, fly, the flyers or the cards and all these different forms, you're saying the flowers, fruits, etc. Who else is trying to pursue it, the, this law and who is not being reached by the law? I mean, because it seems to me that. The people on the street are pursuing, but not the people that got the big package with the cards. You know, the people who really think the strategy. Could you? Yeah. It, the reason that we went after the distributors was because we wanted to squeeze the distributors to get to the higher ups. But these gangs are so advanced nowadays that the distributors don't really know who the higher ups are. They only go up to a certain level. Uh, it's kind of like internet fraud. You don't know who is at the end of it. They only know a certain, uh, to a certain level, uh, and then they kind of stop there. But we wanted to go after the distributors because at least that was a foot in the door. At least that was a foot in to get to the mid-level. Hopefully we can get to the higher level, um, but the district attorney, we try to arm the district attorney with all those tools by passing the legislation. Now, we've been working with the district attorney on one piece of legislation that's going to make it very, very tough for them to continue this promotion. Unfortunately, we have to massage the assembly a little bit because the assembly side really doesn't want, doesn't want to pass uh, this piece of legislation that's going to help the district attorneys. They just feel that it's just too much power given to the district attorney. Uh, and they don't, want, they don't want individuals to falsely be um, accused of something that they're not. So we're working with the assembly to, to make it uh, acceptable to them so that we can pass something that can really put an end to, uh, to this trafficking, at least on rules of the avenue. And I believe we have such a bill, we're just working with the assembly to try to work on their end so that it can be acceptable to them. But ideally, if this bill were to pass that I'm talking about, I think we'll put an end because it actually infiltrates the gangs. Uh, and it's something that we have to work out. And what is the status of the bill right now? Right now, we have the bill in the, in the Senate uh, and the Assembly. We also have the bill in the Assembly, but it's not moving in the Assembly because they, they want to tweak it. So we, we, we've met with the District Attorney, um, my office, and the Assembly sponsor so that we, we can end, end the uh, 
committee chair of codes so that we can try to tweak that. Right now, it's stuck in committee. In politics, it's another word for it. It's not going anywhere right now. Senator, thank you so much for your input. As you have educated yourself on this issue, because it's right in your backyard, I challenge each of us here and those who had to go to class at 2 o'clock, Google, and you know how to do it much better than I do, Google or Bing, anti-trafficking organizations. It is amazing the number of groups of, of individuals who have formed uh, organizations to help those who, first of all, to leave the life, and second of all, to survive after leaving the life. Uh, we, last year or the year before, we had a speaker from GEMS in the city. Uh, we have had um, connections with people from ECPAT and Lifeway Network. Uh, so many individuals. Just read Nicholas Kristof's articles if you want to know more about human trafficking. His book, Half the Sky, his documentary. Um, that's the challenge I give to you. And thank you, Senator, for bringing all the information to us. Thank you. Uh, they just recently, about a year ago, they did a, BBC did a, a documentary uh, where they interviewed me and they went back and they traced the international uh, trading of the women to a small little town in Mexico uh, internationally. Where, that's where the most of the women were being uh, pulled from. Um, but it comes from all over the world. People, women come from all over the world. And a lot, of the, a lot of what people don't know about is that domestically, it's increasing. Women, young teenagers from different states want to get out of the small town, want to come to New York City, want to live a, a fabulous life, and they get sucked into this allure of New York City and getting everything handed to them, and when they get here, they're trapped. So more and more, you have local, um, homegrown teenage women, teenage girls that are participating, being sucked into this life, because it becomes more of a problem trafficking women in from other places, but if you can get them from here, um, it's a little bit easier. Uh, so we have to really pay attention, and that's why we, awareness has to be uh, key. And Googling uh, the information uh, and looking for these anti-trafficking groups that can be helpful will go a long way in educating every one of you uh, on this issue. On behalf of Queensborough Community College, I'd like to thank Senator Peralta for joining us today. We commend his valiant efforts to raise awareness of human trafficking, seek justice for its victims, and increase the penalties of those who perpetuate this horrendous exploitation. We share his concerns and have hope that his leadership will indeed be an impetus for change. Thank you so much, Senator.